Welcome to the Sanity Project Podcast, where you can awaken your mind to clarity and success even in today's life challenges. We're here to provide insights and solutions that will help you live a sane, healthy, and prosperous life. Here is your host, Joanne Victoria. Hello, everybody. This is Joanne Victoria with another amazing episode of the Sanity Project Podcast. You are here to discover a life of clarity, confidence, sanity, and entrepreneurial success. Our guest today is Daniel Tolson. Daniel Tolson is a former Australian champion athlete and a business coach specializing in emotional intelligence. The road to getting there was never easy for someone who grew up having a linear, sequential learning disability, which Daniel can explain during our conversation. He wanted to do more, so he pushed through these barriers and did not allow the disabilities to stop him. That experience of creating his breakthrough and sustaining it set him up for a series of career highs, such as co-leading 17,000 cabin crews, launching his own business, and building a global business that impacts more than 15,000 people, 100 times their life and income. Welcome to the show, Daniel Tolson. Joanne, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm grateful that you are here because I know you're going to have great insight for the listeners who are focused on leadership. Yes, the most important thing, leadership. You know, I I heard it once by a good friend of mine, Brian Tracy, he said, leadership is the ability to get followers. And I think we're all familiar with getting followers on social media today. That's quite easy. But to get it in the real world is a different story. And on my journey, I thought to myself, how can we get followers? And then I was watching a movie one time, and it was called When Harry Met Sally. And I figured it out. We have to have the When Harry Met Sally model of leadership. (laughs) We have to be able to look at somebody and say, I want what they're having. And so I believe that in life, we've got to get the result first. And once we get the result and it's working for us, people look at us and say, well, I want what you're having. And that's how I see leadership today. I think that you're right, because I know that uh, several of my listeners, plus other people that I know and my clients go, how do you do that? How do you get there? And, you know, how do you find out about this? And what you're proposing here is a solution for them to how to do that. And it's, Absolutely. And Absolutely. the solution, the path may be simple, but it's not always that easy to get to it. Because we all start from a different place on the path. You know, with a lot of personal development, I see a lot of people struggle. They go to the same course, they acquire the same information, and we hear that if you just do what successful people do, you'll get the same result. But we have to be very clear on what our starting point is. And that's where a lot of people get confused. They look at the expert and they go, wow, it's working for the expert. However, that expert might be 20 or 30 or 40 years down the path already. So you've got to have an accurate self-assessment and say, well, where am I actually starting from? And that's a challenge because 95% of their population claim to be emotionally intelligent yet only 10 to 15% are. And there's nothing to be embarrassed about, about only having 10 to 15% of your emotional intelligence turned on. It's just a fact for most of us. And it's something we've got to learn. It's not an inborn attribute. We have to acquire it throughout the years. Yes, it comes from experience and and self-awareness, I would imagine. Self-awareness... is is the first pillar. You know, we talk about five pillars of emotional intelligence and it all starts at self-awareness. Self-awareness is understanding why I think and feel the way that I do. And if we've all had these experiences at school where we just want to uh, get along with people, we just want to fly under the radar, we don't want to be different, we just want to be normal. And so once we get into our 30s and 40s, we start to question that and we say, I don't want to be like everybody else. I want to be different. But to be different, you've got to understand both your strengths and your weaknesses. You've got to understand your likes and your dislikes. You've got to understand your motivators, and you've also got to understand your demotivators. And that's a very important part of self-awareness. Yes, I wonder how many people are willing to put their ego aside and 
look at what does not work for them in their lives because that is what's standing in their way of achieving um, self-awareness and leadership skills. Well, who am I without my ego? Well, and, and our ego, we have created this over our entire life. And I was having an experience like that yesterday. I was having a conversation with a consultant and he's 20 years younger than me. And he's bringing to me new ideas. And I said to him, I said, you're just going to have to uh, pump the brakes for a little bit. I said, I've got 10 years of bad habits <laughs> that I have to unwire right now. I said, I love what you're sharing with me. But as the information's coming in uh, and you're filling up the cup, I've got to empty out some of the old stuff. And and it's quite challenging because to discover who you are now, you've also got to let go of who you thought you were yesterday. But yes. That's challenging. Yes, every day can be looked upon as a new day, but if you carry over those old habits and patterns, it, it's the same as it was yesterday. You know that old saying, wherever you go, there you are. And it's so true. We take us wherever we go. I remember having a boss years ago. He'd say to the uh, rest of the team, leave, leave the baggage at the door. And I looked at him and I thought, <laughs> I said, that's easy if it's physical baggage. But the emotional baggage, you can't leave at the door. It's part of you. The only thing you can do is you've got to learn to let it go mentally and emotionally, and then you can be fully rid of it. However, it does take time. And it's not as, just, it's not as simple as saying, just leave it at the door. It's not how it works. I worked with members of the police force, and after they had been through traumatic events, they were told by their counsellors, just park that incident over there. Especially, essentially what they're asking them was to repress that stuff. Push it deep down into your unconscious mind where you put all the other stuff that you don't want to deal with. Yeah, well, and which, it and it'll come and bite you in the butt anyway. <laughs> it triggers off psychosomatic illness and they go, oh, I wonder where that came from. Mm-hmm. Well, let's have a look at what's repressed. And, it, and that's tough because when, when people talk about repressed memories or repressed emotions, you're working in the invisible, and people don't trust in the invisible. People say, hey, I've got faith. Faith is trusting in the invisible. But when it comes to these mental and emotional baggages, it's invisible, and they can't see it. And so they don't believe what they can't see, and that's the challenge. We've got to become aware of all of that, too, on the process of change. And is this how you work with your clients? One of the things that I do to do today, Joanne, is... I trust in science, and it's not that I'm asking science to replace my job. It's because of what the world is used to today, and I'll give you the example. I was uh, beaten up by six guys, and they did a good job trying to kill me one night, and I went down to the hospital, and um, one of them, uh, I, I ended up with a broken arm because of the incident, and the doctor said to me, it looks like your arm's broken, and now I looked at my arm, and I thought, yeah, well, it looks broken. (laughs) <laughs> but I can only see it from the surface layer. I can't see what's happening on the inside. Right. And he said, Daniel, look, it looks broken, but let's do an X-ray. So he took me into the theatre. He did an X-ray, brought it back out and said, oh, that's exactly where it's broken. He said, there's two things you can do, Daniel. One, you can leave it and just hopefully that it grows back into place correctly. And if that doesn't work, six weeks later, we can re-break the arm. <laughs> And I went, oh, that sounds really painful. He said, or based on the x-ray, I know exactly what needs to be done, which we need to put a couple of plates in there, a couple of pins. We can do the operation today and six weeks from now, you can be playing sports again. And immediately I trusted in that science because I could see the invisible. And I said, yes, let's do that. So I took that concept and I have brought that into personal development with my clients. We use science today to measure their emotional intelligence. We use science today to help them understand the invisible, who they are, their behaviours, their emotions. And immediately what happens, and as we said before, 95% of people claim to be emotionally intelligent, but only 10 to 15% are. And then they look at the science and say, that is exactly what I thought intuitively my entire life, and this has just confirmed exactly what I knew. Like with my arm... I thought I had a broken arm, but once the x-ray came along, I knew I had a broken arm, and then I could make the right decision about my future. Based on the bottom line 
insights into what is truly going on with your arm and your and or your life and or your business. You have to know. You have to see what's standing in your way. And um, it's a great thing. Leave it six weeks later. Come back and break it and just oh, take sure care of it today. Salmon. I am full. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, however it was framed, it seemed to have make, made a lot of sense to you. And it also helps other people that you work with. So you said that your ideal client wakes up in the morning and says, I'm feeling stuck and I don't know what to do next. How can you help someone who wakes up? I I think there are quite a few people, especially today, wake up and they are stuck. What is my next step? I personally have voices in my mind, in my head, in my body who tell me what my next step is. Um, if I listen to them, so you have to listen, you have to listen. And if I don't listen, I'm speaking for myself, audience, if I don't listen, I get into trouble. So it's much easier for me to listen to what my voices tell me, my committee. I have a committee, a certain number of people there. And they, you know, if I say I need to get unstuck, what do I need to do? And they come up with some bizarre uh, task, I will pay attention to the bizarre task. But not everybody has enough faith in themselves and in their intuition to do that. Mm-hmm. Do you have clients that are as weird as I am? <laughs> I think they're in the same bucket. You know, my my clients, um, and, and I think if we can make a, a small distinction here, mm-hmm. is you're listening to your enteric brain, your gut brain. Your enteric brain, your gut brain, is your stomach. And our stomach is where our intuition comes from. And a lot of people haven't got down to listen to the enteric brain. So there's three forms of intelligence in the body. We have our head brain, we have our heart brain, and then we have our gut brain. Now, our head brain uh, is a form of intelligence. It focuses on a lot of logic. And the thoughts that go through our mind every day, about 70% of the thoughts that we think are actually counterintuitive to what we want. Mm. So we say we have about 70,000 thoughts per day, and at least 70% of those are counterproductive. So you say to yourself, I want to have a loving relationship. And then you have a conflicting thought in there that says, but who are you to be loved? The last time you're loved, they took advantage of you. The last time you fell in love, they rejected you and criticized you. But then that gut brain says, you are deserving of love. They weren't criticizing you. They were criticizing themselves and they were projecting onto you. <laughs> and so then we have these inner conflicts between the head, the heart, and even the gut. So my clients, when they have that uh, problem, they think they're alone. And I wrote a book many years ago and it was called You Are Not Alone because these are the conversations that we don't tend to have with our friends. If I say to my friends, I'm talking to myself, they're going to think I'm weird. Mm. If I say it to my doctor, they're going to try to medicate me. No, there's nothing wrong with me. But they haven't been educated on how to understand those voices. So my clients, they say, you know, I I feel stuck and I don't know what to do next. They're not solution aware. They just know the problem is that they're stuck. And when they meet me, they normally are looking for three things by the time they find me. They want influence, impact and income. They want to catapult their influence. They want to become more influential in the lives of their customers. They want to accelerate their impact. They've got these big dreams. They've got these big goals. They've got these big objectives, but they just don't know how to take the next step. And then thirdly, they want to unleash new income levels. Now, a client recently said to me, Daniel, $5 in revenues is not enough. And I asked him, yeah, I asked him, why? Why is $5 billion not enough? And he said, because on $5 billion, I've only been able to feed 2 million homeless people. And then I got it. The reason why he was building his business, the reason why he was growing, was because he needed the money to impact the lives. And he said, if we can make more money, then we can feed more people. And he's fed 2 million so far. So they're the three things that my clients are looking for when they meet me. And I I really love that you mentioned there the intuition. You know, all of us have this intuition. And 
men's and women's intuition, when it's measured, they say both men and women have the same intuitive abilities. Just the difference with the ladies, they tend to follow it more often than the men. And we see these shows like the Funniest Home Videos in America where the ladies go, oh, I'm not going to do that. But the men go and do it and they hurt themselves. Yeah. Yes. Well, yes. And the women always say, you know, it's that's what they do because they're men. Something to prove. I think it's just we're wired differently and people don't understand that, even though men and women each have intuitive uh, insights doesn't mean we're identical. We are so different. We are so different. It, I think the if if we did the numbers, the likelihood of somebody else being exactly like you is something like fifty billion to one. So it's pretty much impossible on the planet with this size today. We are unique. And when I was growing up. I just wanted to fit in. I had my learning disabilities, but I just wanted to fit in. So I just kind of got along with everybody just to go along. And I wouldn't stand up for myself. I wouldn't speak my truth. I wouldn't be in alignment with my values. But as I started to mature, I looked around and said, I actually don't want to be like everybody else. (laughs) And I had to learn to embrace these learning difficulties. And you've got to unwire those old... um, commands that you've given yourself along the way, those suggestions that other people have given you, like you'll never succeed, you're not smart enough, you won't uh, have what you want without an education. But then I realized I do like to learn, but maybe the things that I like to learn, I just can't get in formal education. And so once I ventured into professional development and ongoing education, I went, wow, I actually love to learn. And it's easy to learn this stuff because I love it. And that was a big breakthrough for me. Yeah, that's that's huge. I remember when I was first married the first time, and um, I was at home taking care of my first child. Somebody knocked on the door, and they were selling. That's how far back I go? They were selling um, books whatever they're called, um, information, books on information. And I loved to learn. I wanted to learn everything there was to learn. And I bought these books and I was receiving a book a month for a few years and it was the encyclopedia. And it was like, I didn't know there was so much to learn Mm -hmm. and it hasn't stopped yet. I learned something new every day. And I think that there are people who are listening feel similarly in that they want to learn, but there is something standing in their way. You know, is this going to be the person that is going to help me learn? Is this going to be the person that is going to help me make an impact and accelerate my impact and unleash new income levels? So tell us why um, they should call you, contact you, email you. That's the million-dollar question, isn't it? I, I love that question. For me, what I learned is that I love to learn. And I also had to create some new rules about learning. And the first thing I had to do was to get myself in an environment that supported me and my growth. And I had been, uh, I was born and raised in Australia, but I never felt it was my belonging place. And our friends in New Zealand talk about a two-donger wai wai. And the two-donger wai wai is your belonging place. So once I moved out of my comfort zone, which was Sydney, Australia, I moved to Dubai and I lived in the United Arab Emirates. And once I got there, I started to open up. I really started to blossom. I started to bloom, come into bloom. And I realized the information and the ideas that I had were actually more valuable outside of my own country. So I went on this beautiful journey of learning and self-discovery. And my biggest learning was in 2010 when I had a telephone call. It was 4 a.m. in the morning, and I picked up the phone, and uh, my duty controller called me and said, Daniel, there's been an accident on the aircraft. And I said, okay, is this a peer support call? And they said, no, it's not. It's your fiance." <laughs> and so in 2010, I went, oh, no. Out of all the things that I've been training for, it's uh, my fiance that's been involved in the accident. So my life went to a turning point at that stage, and I thought to myself, If this stuff that I've learned, how to uh, rewire the mind, emotional intelligence, if this can work, I can really help my fiancé along. 
And so we, we come across some big challenges. Um, she was definitely suffering with mental and emotional health challenges, depression. And I came home um, about a year after the accident and um, she was there in the kitchen and she wanted to end her own life. And then I said to her, I said, look, um, whatever you're doing is not working. You've got to start to um, try some of this personal development. So over the next couple of years, I started to teach her what I learned. And then she overcome that depression. She broke through her anxieties. Uh, and she went through some big turning points. You know, she almost lost uh, our daughter in pregnancy three times. But she was able to remain really optimistic. And so I started to see these big breakthroughs and these transformations. And the three things that she was breaking through was fears, doubts, and limiting beliefs. And I realized that there was four big fears. The first big fear for her was losing control. She lost her job. She lost her stream of income. And she didn't feel in control of her life anymore. Secondly, she was fearing uh, criticism. She had to explain herself over and over and again about this accident. And she just felt like she was being, uh, having a dressing down for years. And it started to impact her confidence. Thirdly, she had to uh, leave the comfort zone. And for her, it meant she had to totally reinvent herself. She had been cabin crew and working with three of the most prestigious airlines for a decade, for her adult life at that stage. And she had worked towards that for 20 years. So she had to reinvent herself. And that's incredibly hard, especially when you look out to the future and you plan your future based on your current career, especially when you love it. And then finally, uh, she had these fears of trying and failing. You know, I've just done this for 10 years. It's my life. This is what I wanted to do. It was my forever job and I've failed. You know, I've had this accident and I can never do this again. If I do something that I love again, am I going to get hurt? And so we started to peel back those layers of emotions and my wife just turned out to be a story of success. And then today, she's out there impacting lives. She she has trained about 700 people in the science of emotional intelligence just in the past uh, six months, and she takes them through scientific insights. So one of the reasons why um, I say to come and work with me is because my wife and I both know what it's like to lose our careers our jobs. We've had to leave the places where we live. Uh, our life put us both on social security. At 34, we were living in our grandparents' spare rooms, but we're able to turn our life around using these practical ideas. And today, I've personally uh, impacted more than 17,000 people's lives throughout my business. My clients report back $100 million in new income levels just from applying my strategies over the past three years alone. And they're working for us. We, we, we have that when Harry met Sally lifestyle. People meet us and say, what are you and Ninny having? Because we want the same. And so we've applied all of this to us and we know that it works in our lives. And you've experienced it all. And that's, to me, that's the best sales point that you can have. It's not as if you are standing on top of a tower and speaking down to people. You're telling people your story, your wife's story, your family story on what to do and how to move forward in a healthy and mindful way. So how can people find you, Daniel? If you want to learn how to break through your fears, your doubts and your limiting beliefs, come and check out my masterclass. I hold a masterclass every Monday and it's called Unleashed Masterclass. And it's all about breaking through our fears, our doubts, our limiting beliefs. That's unleashedmasterclass.com. I hope everybody wrote that down. I always tell my listeners, once they listen to a podcast, find a space and time and a pen and a yellow pad because it's more, uh, your brain will feel it more and re-listen to this podcast Change, Conflict, and Crisis, Seven Wonderful Ways to Become a Leader in Times of Rapid Change. I want to thank Daniel Tolson for being here today um, from Taiwan, very early in his morning, not early in my morning. So we appreciate his tenacity in putting this together and being here. Thank you so much, Daniel. I really appreciate it, and I hope you, hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you, Joanne. You're amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Sanity Project Podcast. 
please go to AskJoanneVictoria.com to listen to more podcasts. Check out Joanne's coaching programs and get a free copy of her report, Five Steps to Achieve Life-Work Harmony. That's AskJoanneVictoria.com. Take care and thanks for being here.